It had been front page news since November in 1974. A high school teacher, Marvin King, and his former student, Melanie Ann Hartsfield, were shot to death with a shotgun near a lover's lane in Henry County. Police first hunted a suspect, then decided to charge the man who'd found the bodies, a black man named Jerry Banks. I was only focused on two people from my hometown, my area, the school teacher, Marvin King and Melanie Ann Hartsfield. I investigated them. And what he discovered was that there were several other murders that were committed that day, and he found that these murders were connected, and his conclusion is that Jerry Banks was framed. I went back to the Sunday paper and looked at those six pictures again, and I said, what in the world would be the chances that the same group of people killed all four of the other victims? This is a series of interviews with Charles L. Sargent, the subject matter expert of the quadruple murders of 1974 and the author of Sins of Henry County in a podcast by the same name. What if they were all murdered for the same reason? For the next four years, Banks waited. He got new lawyers. They turned up witnesses who'd heard the shots the afternoon of the murder, witnesses who were never called. They discovered lists of evidence which the police had, but had never been introduced at the trials. Banks was to get a new trial January 5th, but then this month came some startling evidence. Philip Howard, one of the case's original investigators, had had possession of some shotgun shells found on the scene, which were later used as evidence. Banks' lawyers discovered Howard had a history of tampering with and manipulating evidence in other cases. On, on Thursday, the murders took place. Friday morning, they went back out after the sun came up. Uh, actually, they went out there at 4 o'clock in the morning with floodlights until the sun came up, searching for evidence. Couldn't find nothing. Philip Howard, lead detective, shows up around 9 o'clock, and within 5 or 10 minutes, they find he finds two shells, and another detective finds a third shell. Well, Philip Howard had been testifying in two trials that he testified it on Sunday afternoon, that he went to Jerry's house on Sunday afternoon. Uh, Jerry Banks says they got his gun at 5 o'clock in the morning when they took him home after keeping him all night the night of the murders, which would have been the morning of 8 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning to 8. But Bud Kelly says, yeah, I heard the shots. but it I, I would imagine that his gun was left there after he was taken home. They said they did not get his gun when they picked him up in court. They, I think said. Barnes Barnes picked him up and he said, did, it, did you pick his gun up at that time? He says, no. I, I can't think so what I remember Banks being there that night because I, yeah, for, I talked for, to him. For his statement. I as a, to him, whether I took his statement or whether I just talked to him. And I, I think the gun was there. Now, when Sugar Howard fired that gun, I don't remember. Bud Kelly said it was on a Friday. Well, I, I speak that would be before the evidence shells were found. Hours. I doubt that, but I, I wouldn't. I don't remember. So there's three shells found at the murder scene November the 8th. Those shells were sent directly to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation documented. Now Sunday comes along two days later and the story is the sheriff sends two officers out to Jerry's house and get his shotgun and they test his shotgun on Sunday behind the courthouse and the purpose is to take these shells and send them to the GBI and see if the shells from Jerry's gun matched the evidence shells found immediately after the murders on Friday morning. And they did that. And this was November the 10th was the Sunday that they said that they fired Jerry's shotgun for ballistics comparison. But they didn't send the shells to the Georgia Bureau of Investigations for a month later. And I have said all along, and everybody else knew anything about the case, if anything could be, if in any way those, the integrity of the shells that were found at the scene could be damaged, that the case collapsed. And that happened. And the case collapsed, it was not retried. That was over Bud Kelly's statement. No, it had nothing to do with Bud Kelly's statement. It had, well, it, it, it may have partially had something to do with his expected testimony, because it had to do with 
the question of whether Shughai were tampered with the shape. That was the question that we could not. There was credible evidence that that could have happened, and we could not, through other wit credible witnesses, conclusively show the chain of custody of the, sh the red Winchester Western shell. If you ruled out Bud Kelly's statement, yeah. No, I'm not ruling out anything. I'm saying that I didn't even remember Bud Kelly's statement. Now that you mention it, I, that I vaguely remember he made some statement. But the fact that I knew Chuck I was fired the gun, I think I saw him fired, I'm not sure. You didn't testify to that. The, the Sheriff's Department on Sunday, November the 10th, fires three rounds. Biggest murder case in Henry County, and they fired Jerry Banks' gun, and they've got three rounds in their hand. Why did they wait a month to send them to the GBI to compare them? On Saturday, right after the murders, Lead Detective Philip Howard gets a call from somebody and he hightails it to Florida. Three white men in a white van that were seen leaving the Eugene Barge murder are abducted in Florida. Why does he need to go down there? Going back to the Barge case, looking through the FBI files, There were three phone calls made the morning that Barge was murdered. Three phone calls, to the, one to the police department in Atlanta, one to Hateville, and I don't know where the third went to, but it, that, there's a thousand pages there you can see. These phone calls were witnesses saying, hey, I saw three white guys in a white van leave the murder scene of Eugene Barge. Now, normally when a passerby, a witness, a, a citizen sees something like that, they'll say, uh, yeah, I saw three white guys in a white van jump in the van. They took off and they headed this direction. I didn't get their tag number, but there was some body damage on the front or there was some this, that, and the other, something significant. They didn't give any significant details about something that a normal person might relay. You know what they told the police? I saw three white guys leaving in a white van, the murder scene of Eugene Bars, and they're staying in room 218 at the hotel in Atlanta, the Atlanta Host Inn. How do they know where they're staying? What kind of witness gives that information but somebody that if they had tried to disrupt the apple cart they would have been laying next to barge i believe that these were cops that were on the take getting that extra money on a routine basis turn a blind eye to let these trucks go through the atlanta airport Two days after the arrest of four prominent Henry County officials in McDonough, Georgia, on drug smuggling charges, residents are still in a state of shock. Longtime controversial sheriff Jimmy Glass, the chief of police Herschel Childs, Larry Tew, judge of the probate court, and William Hinton, a former county commissioner, were all charged with providing drug smuggling protection and given $20,000 bonds each. According to the Drug Enforcement Administration, Judge Tew promised the undercover agent he could land a plane loaded with drugs at this airport under the protection of the law. And it was just a hit basically to cover up the fact that the police and the Dixie Mafia were all profiting off of the Atlanta airport trafficking drugs. Hateville, College Park, and another little town, all they're they're border up to the Atlanta airport. Their 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 city borders those three jurisdictions border the Atlanta airport. And they were turning a blind eye and getting paid handsomely to let drugs go through. But these are happy drugs. Quaaludes. I mean it wasn't fentanyl. These were happy pills. Hippies were buying them like crazy. I mean nobody was gonna die from this stuff. Even the cocaine that went through, it, 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 it was just 
recreational drugs. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get paid five or ten, maybe fifty thousand. I don't know what they were getting paid, but they were turning a blind eye and uh, letting, the, letting the traffic flow. Bards didn't see it that way. McDonough is not the only South Georgia town where law enforcement officials have been charged with smuggling protection operations. In Appling County, just a few miles away, 18 people, including five former sheriff's officers, were arrested just last week. A tremendous amount of money is involved in the illegal uh, drug business, and with that comes the ability to uh, influence people whether they be law enforcement officers or other people. Hal Craig says that the FBI was in on the Henry County smuggling case because they were investigating at least one of the four men arrested on other political corruption charges. But the thing is, they test fired the three shells on November the 10th, Sunday, just a few days after the murder, and on December the 1st, if I'm not mistaken, the DA in Atlanta, Lewis Slayton, dropped all charges on the three white guys in the white van that failed a lie detector test and let them go. December 1st. December 2nd, Henry County Sheriff's Department, Jimmy Glass and Philip Howard, finally sends the shells to the GBI the next day. I'm Robert William Johnson. I'm getting paid to kill a police officer. He comes up and steps out of his truck, and I step out of the woods, and I shoot him three times. Now, do you go down the road about five miles and bury that gun? Normally, yeah. But his day is not over. He's got two other people to kill in Henry County. The Henry County Sheriff's Department had abducted Melanie Ann Hartsfield from college, brought her across the Henry County line. She called Marvin King. Marvin King comes to rescue her. They, they don't let either one of them cross the Henry County line. They take them to the, to the murder site and sit around for a couple of hours for these yo-yos in Atlanta to come down and kill them. If you look at the murder scene of Melanie and Marvin, they were both shot in a dirt road. And you can see Melanie probably weighed 120, 30 pounds. She had bled out, and they drug her over 100 yards into a pine thicket to hide the bodies. You can see the blood smeared. Marvin King weighed 185 pounds, and his blood is not smeared. Two people picked him up. They did not drag him off the road. Jerry Banks couldn't have picked him up by himself by any means, but he was picked up. And in order to pick up a man that has been shot in the back, in the back of the head, when you put your arms under his, under his armpits and you do the lifting, you're gonna get blood all over your clothes. Okay, I found in the FBI file two letters and I'm gonna the first one was kind of an invitation, uh, and it says, Detective, meet me on Wednesday night at the Nevada Club at 12 o'clock for details. If I won't be arrested for being involved, bring so-and-so, another cop. Both wear red coats or red shirts, Clay and Blank, another cop, are already on schedule for the night before Halloween. Clay is the police chief of Hateful Police Department. He's invited. In fact, he's already said he's on schedule. Go all the way to the back, talk to the bartender, I will meet you, don't bring so-and-so, another cop. Watch wives closely, both day and night. Now this is the Dixie Mafia sending a letter to the Hateville Police Department, giving them their marching orders. Like, I don't know, 
and threaten them. Sorry you didn't keep your appointment last Tuesday. So evidently they had another meeting on a Tuesday after this one here. So it sounds like the police officers were not making their meetings. Guess you thought it was a joke. The point is, this group feels a cop should live up to what his uniform and his job represents. This group, Dixie Mafia. And you said this letter was postmarked to pretty yeah. much a week to the day. Clay, uh, now, now this is, th this, this first letter was for a Wednesday night, inviting him to this bar. Then, I didn't, I didn't, this is the only second letter, but in this letter, it says, sorry you didn't keep your appointment for Tuesday night. So evidently, after inviting him to the bar on a Wednesday before Halloween, they must have requested them to meet again, and they didn't respond. And this is the repercussion. Clay is getting punished for all men in charge. You for the detective division, and so-and-so for the uniformed officers. They're getting punished. Who calls the police department and tells them they're getting punished? Somebody that's got somebody over the barrel. And this goes along when you get paid to turn a blind eye and then things go awry, you, you, you get in step. The letter goes on. The timing still stands for this Wednesday or Thursday unless changes are made at the last minute. Good luck, Sarge. Please watch out for your wives. They are not the target, but who knows? You just don't get a letter like that and in an FBI file and still let the three suspects go. Something is rotten. Now, this letter is postmarked October 29th. The next Wednesday after October 29th, the, excuse me, the next Thursday would have been November the 7th. Barge is that. Hmm? The day Barge was killed. Things are still standing for this Wednesday or Thursday unless things change. Postmark the next th Thursday after this postmark letter was sent to the Hapeville Police Department that Thursday Eugene Bard was executed going to work. 